Right. Could you hold your mic a little closer? For some reason, you don't sound that clear to me. Okay. Uh, I mean, we begin within three minutes. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Sure. That's Thank better. You. Thank you. And you expect, uh, is there a question and answer period? Uh, maybe a few questions, if you allow, if you permit. After the end of your talk, we can have one or two, couple of questions, if you allow. Very few, very few, because I can't hear. Okay, well, one question. Maybe one question. Is that fine? That's absolutely fine. Thank you. Thank you. And people can always, I'll tell them, people can always write me. Pardon? People can write to me. Yes. People can write On email. Yes, okay. uh, I think they can write to you. Or I, I will type it in the chat box. The question can be typed in the chat box. Is that okay? What? It can be what? It can be. Uh, we will email the questions if necessary. Is that okay? Email is fine. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So we begin. Uh, are you yes, okay? please. Thank you. Uh, so. Uh, Good morning to Professor Anstor, who joins us today from New York, which is now 9 a.m. there, local time. And uh, good evening to friends and colleagues from India. It is 6.30 in the evening now, on the 4th of May. We are um, all attending to this one-day colloquium on archiving cultural assemblage, exploring shared goals, emits diversities, and Professor Ann Stoller, a new school for social research, New York, will be delivering the keynote. We are really privileged to have Professor Stoller with us today. And the title of Professor Stoller's keynote address will be The Bend of Archival Light on Praxis and Politicality. Uh, before uh, we uh, hand it over to Professor Stoller, I would like to introduce formally uh, the keynote speaker, the distinguished keynote speaker, Professor Ann Stoller who is Willie Brand Distinguished Professor of Anthropology and Historical Studies at the New School for Social Research, founding co-editor of Political Concepts, a critical, uh, I mean, um, she is the founding co-editor of Political Concepts, a critical lexicon, and her books include Duress, Imperial Durabilities in Our Times, which was published in 2016, Thinking with Baliba, co-edited, 2022, 2020, I'm sorry, Imperial Debris on Ruins and Rumination, edited, which was published in 2013, along the archival drain, Epistemic Anxieties and Colonial Common Sense, published in 2009, Carnal Knowledge and Imperial Power, Race and the Intimate in Colonial Rule, published in 2002, Tensions of Empire, edited with Frederick Cooper, which was published in 1997, and Race and the Education of Desire, which was published in 1995. Her other book, um, Interior Frontiers, Essays in the Entrails of Inequality, 
is published in 2022 from Oxford University <laughs> Press. Professor Stola is the founding director of the Institute for Critical Social Inquiry, devoted to bringing together fellows from around the world with the work of major thinkers who have shaped the course of social inquiry. Professor Stola <coughs> needs no introductions, is very well known as a distinguished scholar across the globe, and her profile reads very big, and uh, I will just cut it short to say that she has uh, Hold, uh, you know, she has held visiting position to many universities across the world, and she has been in the board of various uh, journals, academic uh, publishing houses, etc. And uh, we are really privileged today to have Professor Ann Stola, who will be delivering the keynote address. Over to you, Professor Stola. Thank you so much. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you for having me. First of all, I want to make. Is my voice clear? Yes, you are clear. Is my voice clear? Yes, yes, you are absolutely clear. I can't hear you now. I cannot hear you. You are clear. You are audible. No, I cannot hear you. So as long as you can hear me right now, you can? Yes, we can. We can hear you. Now, that's good. 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 That's um, to listen to my um, collaborating partners. However, it is nine in the morning, and if I came when your conference started, it would have been three in my morning. Um, so that is not very, would not be very easy for me. Um, but I wanted to thank, first of all, Anija for inviting me to give this address and, um, and for inviting me to participate. I may be wrong, but I'm imagining that we wouldn't be here at this conference on archives if we had not already turned it in richly different and unruly ways from treating archives as unmeditated sources for extraction, which is how they often have been treated, their content and form. Instead, their content and form as subjects of inquiry in their own right. Are you being able to hear me? Please let me know if you can hear me. So I won't rehearse these arguments. I won't rehearse these arguments, but instead we'll be talking about what I see as this new bend of archival life to praxis, politicality, and the political traction of archiving. My paper is a bit long. I do not mind if you say we only have five minutes left. I want people to know that I don't have that much time, unfortunately, for the chat to hear questions. But you are more than welcome. Anyone is more than welcome to email me with your questions, and we can begin. Often it's hard to think the present. The present is hard to discern. When Kant, Immanuel Kant, in 1784, asked, what is this question? It was a bold question in a philosophical field that honored the abstract, timeless, and universal with ancient Greece as an ahistorical site of veneration. When Foucault seized on Kant's query 200 years later, turning to Kant and Foucault's uncharacteristically plain words and seemingly straightforward questions, so here's another one, what difference does today introduce with respect to yesterday? In doing so, he rendered the question dependent on a challenging requisite by defining the historical moment more specifically and by adding another reflection on an intimately related but oblique plane. The task was demanding to consider an historical ontology of ourselves. 
so he turns it back to us. The emphasis, as Ian Hacking described it in his own book of the same name, is what is it possible to be or do today? Or posed somewhat differently, is what we thought was once indispensable today not so? The ourselves, the historical ontology, are open, but what was not open was the linchpin unstated, those relations of power and context defining history, flashpoints when events showed themselves as breaches of self-evidence, disruptions of what was once considered common sense. Personhoods and histories are refracted with particular intent, focused through those relations of power that bind us so inequitably and feverishly now. Critical to this venture, and I think is, this is such an important insight, that the we cannot be named in advance. It must follow the question, who is asking it, and the kind of question asked. The challenge seems to be, to be one that might afford some purchase on those archival terms we've heard so much about, some far more than terms actually but rather basic overhauls, excisions, empowered dissensus, crashing the barricades of streamlined history in this narrative convention. A history of the present is what I'm suggesting, may offer a compelling way to look at the various installments of how archives have been treated, what and who they have served, the war zones of conflict and contest, and what constitutes an archive, actually what one is and who and what it's for, and why what seems to be a broader humanity somehow cares about it now. As so many are redefining what they are, the question of a history of the present invites us to ask, who are these new practitioners? They're not just historians trained with PhDs, that's for sure, or archivists. The old and newly installed archives invite us who remain in the shadows, shorn of place. These are collective queries, I think we're asking. Well, the venture itself refuses the teleology that these histories of the archival present had to be this way in the weather. There's no search for originary or archival past. The vantage point is from the present. It may be a fringe history, and this is important, newly recast from disqualified to qualified ones. That's a term of, of Foucault, but um, in, in homage to Professor Ranajad Guha, who we have just last lost. I think he often thinks of that way too. Is my voice clear for everyone? And am I talking too fast? I guess there's no one there. Okay, well then I won't worry about it. Elsewhere, new and vociferous battles over what should remain consigned as if secrets of the state. These aren't histories of which we're ignorant, innocently ignorant. I think that's important. Some are rather histories, demoted, deemed unreliable and ignored. Some come out of the archival vault, disparage this history as evidence, as knowledge at all. From those, some of us have tended to look away. An historical ontology, ontology could be about you or me, but here it's about our collective selves at this political moment, here and now. It's more about the conditions of possibility, revisions and failures that make up what this archival field has invested in and what it does today is what I'm worried about. Not least historical ontologies mark and are marked with relations of power. We never can forget that. That disqualifies some kinds of knowledge. Qualify others that in turn harbor and then incite insurrectionary knowledge in the intricacies of their folds. At moments made opportune, belligerent, bellicose, outside the bounds of archival ordinance and imperial control. Dispersions rather than origins. And this is important. We're not looking for an originary moment, right? An archive started when this happened. But dispersions rather than origins with unswerving lineages from past to present mark genealogical work 
So they're never going to get there in a linear history. My own tracking is hard to detach from the Dutch and French colonial archives. I spent decades, probably four decades now, attempting to glean for what was not said. It's not only what's said. It was what was not said or written. What could be not said should not be said. And what were watermarks on paper, only visible in refracted light. And not least how race and profits were cemented and what it took for those thriving on the proceeds to look away. Granted, this is a pretty warped perspective, but there are features of these depositifs, as Foucault would call them, these kind of mechanisms, right, of imperial formations, hardly confined to the archives of the Dutch colonial state. So we're not really just talking about the Dutch colonial state. Governance of those who governed, as well as those governed, were built on a distribution and attribution of sentiment with enormous import and affective weight that depended on meting out deferred policies. Right? This is what empires always this one. You know, when you develop, you'll get it. When you can do this, you'll get it. When you show us you're, you're civilized enough. So those deferred promises then invested in a duress, imposing debt, humiliations, that were almost speechless. A heavy ink query on the side of a page. What? What? Did, what? Just the cross page, right? Not part of the official, right? Scratched across a crisp, clean, formal archival page. A grammar rule. It was a grammar rule of sorts that kept officials in line who were critical of the imperial archives, but not the privileges in which they worked. And from those who were the recipients of this barrage of disdain, was resentment, distilled contempt, and apt rage. The distribution of affect was a register of archival governance inscribed, but it was barely named, and it's for you to attune to it. My retorts to crush these victim certitudes and hail reason alone and dismiss sentiment. You know, politics is not about sentiment. My retorts were perhaps too harsh in efforts to recast those zones of colonial power, other zones of colonial power that were often not acknowledged, that depended on racial rule, and legitimated the slow and preemptive violences of a racial state. Colonial archives, as with the fragile imperial democratic polities in which we live, were not built on or conveyed by a grammar that favored the then present tense. This is really unusual. We think of archives from the 19th century as if they were all in the present tense from the 19th century. But they were often coded in the conditional what if? What if they turn to terrorists? What if they turn against us? It's the what if. If they do that, we would have to do this. Coded in the conditional and the imagined, subjunctive, and not least in the speculative. Archives of power, corporate power, colonial power, democratic power, reveal their haunted imaginaries of those who rule often framed by this anticipatory fear a conjuring of underground challenges to authority. Always that, right? Indian history is full of it, right? South Asian history is full of it. Persons of a certain hue, Dalit, who knows, tone, comportment are squashed into imaginaries that made sense of the fictions of race and the necessities of an always more elaborate security apparatus. This is where we find the security regimes of empire. And not unlike the post 9-11 creation of homeland security and a further invalid security state, 
these depositives are not repetitions of the same. Colonialism today does not look like it did with Queen Victoria. These are not isomorphic, but what I call in my books recursive histories of category making and racialized fear, some parts durably, durably mark the present. Others disappear in the folds. The word colonial legacy gets us nowhere. It squashes everything together. Recursion, and recursion is turning back, right? Turning back on that fold rather than repetition. Makes room for newly apparent exposures of a past that's visible before. That's, that's the goal. Right? When it folds differently on a paper, you get to see another plane that you didn't see before. Recursion to me is the name of the game, not repetition. Recursion, though, is deft as much an analytic to consider connectivities and partial recuperations of what archives are and do. Archive as concept, archive as things archive as refusal and political practice. The very term itself, sometimes renewed, sometimes held steady, sometimes bending light onto different archival plans. So what I call archivage, archivage today. So what are the forms and content of archival pursuits today? I like the question, but I'm tentative about the answer. One difference I find striking is how ubiquitous the term is. It doesn't matter where you go. Everybody's doing an archive. It's an archive of architecture. It's an archive of defense. It's an archive of this. Somehow the word archive has been given some kind of power, capacious, in its capacity to name collections, installations, gatherings, compilations of video performances or testimonials, right? But as much so to name political stands and positionality, if this is an arc, our assemblages range over scales of curatorial labor explicitly, and they're explicit outside the police court of expertise. Paper and boys replacing a restrictive defining of evidence. As a primary sites of state imaginaries, archives have split off center state. It's interesting, all we looked at for very long was state archives. Storytelling outside, right, subaltern stories, and then, and then, you know, official archives. Credibilities are only loosely secured, though, by the printed page. The notion that archive labor is the privy of historians initiated by the ritual of going through the archives, right, is an initiation right. We know it preserved in some places. Doctoral students always have to go through it. I went to the archives, and they have to list the archives you went to. Elsewhere deemed rather quaint. In any case, digital archives, no matter how problematic, no matter how much is lost of the tactile, has made the going to the archives a different matter. And COVID has done it too. This just can't go. <laughs> Some of the ubiquity may ride on the favor of etymology from the RA combining two principles. Commencement, as we know, and the seat of command. Everybody puts, you know, Derrida on this, but so many others are doing it before he said it. But that's what everybody quotes is archive fever 10 years after. Nick Dirks, me, Val Daniels, all of us were doing archives, working with them. In fact, I taught a course then, way before Debbie does, um, book archive theater called Ethnography in the Archives. Um, some of the ubiquity may ride on the favor of this uh, etymology because it is commencement of one moment and the seat of command. The archival rubric assigns and confers that this is the site of authority. Intentional coherence. Calling something an archive rather than just a set of documents is an announcement of power and work, right? No matter what the media is. And not least, a public face. 
right? I'm going to put this all over the internet. Have a look. More importantly, I think, is the frequency with which it sets out a political claim. This is crucial. To say you have an art, you're making a political claim. That this is what matters. To collect, to see, to conserve in this way by these people in this moment for the future and now. The black feminists, Audrey Lord's query begs to be posed. And where else could it be more literal and figurative at the same time? She asks, as some of you will know, can the master's tools dismantle the master's house? I hope you can know the quote. Her answer was an assertive no. Others are imagining, however, a different take. The tools are not proprietary. The house is of no interest. Who cares about you know, the building in Jakarta? Dismantling the very beams, the infrastructure supporting the house. Or one can imagine a radical refusal, the archival space, totally other way. We don't care about that building. We're not even going there, right? Sometimes the archive actually exceeds place, right? It can be somewhere else. Collections made into archives of objects, film, video, multimedia installations are hardly new, right? They've been around a long time. But amplify attention to what Dussel to the French. Oh, God, what would you call Dussel to from literature to philosophy? Amazing. He called it remainders. I think of objects corroded could be the art. And it is in the new Palestinian archives. Worn clothing, window curtains stained, kitchen chairs pierced by bullets, embossed with the brutality of extended moments as in Palestine. A room left with only three standing walls that a son lived in and a mother refuses to put up against the fourth wall as her evidence of the body. There's imperial debris, scattered papers, visual and material collections joined to register the weight and the durability of damage. There's the insistence that these archival modalities should take up public and political space. Indictments that can be seen and shared and an urgency to do so. Benjamin, Walter Benjamin, called out a language of things, stones, pans, cardboard boxes. In Ramallah, I was a witness. I was there many times and talked there. I was a witness to something else. The avid attention in an unfinished archive project to what ordinary Palestinians considered, and this was the word used, precious things, precious thing. A copper coffee maker, a worn out bakama, bakama, I, mean, I don't say bakama, so I don't even have to say it, and board, an empty bottle of vintage Chateau Neuf de Pop, one of the finest wines. And this is the most important, a pair of young girls Party shoes. Youth as unfilled, joy or sorrow, still in its original box, still, right, 50 years later, at the time of just before the Nakba, in its box. Items that were not imagined as candidates for a digital trace. The name of one of the archival projects in Uramala was at the much contested Palestine Museum. And it was called, I wonder if any of you are familiar with it, it was called Never Part. A Never Part from people, from things that mattered, and what mattered to some most. A Never Part from Palestine. 
new and well-worn uses of archives and archiving refer to radically different things. Use. Use is a vague, unstable reference. To wield, to deploy, to ply, they can give material or immaterial presence to a political strategy, a statement and a claim again. In our time of reckoning, if not reparation or repair, use may be directed at reassigning a myopic treatment of a well-known compilation of facts into a broader archival compendium. Genocide, dislodged from the singularity of the Holocaust, rendered in the 20th century's plural racist assault, demanding a politics of archival in Paris, a joining of the German massacre of the Herero in Africa, U.S. soldiers and settlers killing of indigenous communities, one after the other. Heroic, celebrated Australians have done the same to indigenous communities, to whom white Australians today do up. Is there a problem? Is there a problem? No, I'm not. White Australians today compile storybooks in a patriotic tribute. Storybooks, think about it. Storybooks to Australia's national shame, as Sarah Ahmed reminds us. This last month alone, the battle over German history and politics claimed front page news in the major German press. What it was about was the politics of comparison to Germany's imperial genocides, not just to the Holocaust. A new film made actually called Germany's Other Genocide. This never before has ever been done, ever. Germany's other genocide, bringing colonial archival history center stage. The Holocaust, for many, still, however, remains the test of inhumanity. Those arguing that the destruction of Palestinian lives, dispossession of land, impoverishment, now in German law deemed anti Semitic. Right? Anti Semitic conferences, performances, and people canceled. I was canceled in Germany for, for not saying the Holocaust was only the, the form of genocide. Deemed anti Semitic, right? Jobs lost. The extraordinary archival work of Isabel Hall in 500 pages of archival documentation of what she called in Africa, among the Herero, absolute destruction, slaughter by German soldiers of Herero, women, men, children. Hers is a major reason of what archive labor entails. The demolition of a horrific politics and imaginary, the controversies, evidence that it is more than a racial state. So, this paper is about seven pages of my passages. So, you're going to have to tell me when you'd like me to give you five more minutes, and I'll, I will go to the conclusion. The comparisons have to call on archive and oral accounts far and wide. The politics of our probably use of what these archives are for have been requisitioned to document what Rod Nixon is a bit. And what? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm distracted by the things going in, up and down and turning around on my screen. Um, surrounding the, the Manhattan Project of Los Alamos, nuclear waste buried in the pockets of the Marshall Islands, no longer habitable. 
some might argue that we are living in the process of material art. Right? And then there are the archives of Agent R. Agent R. is still disfiguring children's bodies. A half a century later in Vietnam, can a body be an archive? Can a body be an archive? Flesh, scarred, bones removed, can that be the parent? What constitute archival labor then? You can't say the same. Much of this work is being done outside the fortresses of state seeking, outside the wall. And much doesn't come from government archives on mortar management, because they say everything's just fine, or sewage, because the population is deprived of these services, are part of a long history, disappeared, erased, excised. But there are other thresholds of detectability as E.L. Weissman, an architect, would put it, the unexpected speed with which pipes corrode, a soil leak of nutrients, evidence of a disaster ecology. But use also has been sought in refiguring what counts as an archive, not by German or American historians, but by those who have reappropriated what they want archives and what they want me to say. The media strength, the renewed aesthetics and politics of dissent that sets aside normative by the forms, as I mentioned earlier. These archives are of dance, theater, media installations, as I said, photography, sensoria that you can touch, feel, see, once to down. These were the ones the value in comparison to the supremacy of the written text. Right? The only kind of archive that contains and holds true. This does not mean, as Diane Taylor, an amazing uh, art historian, wrote some 20 years ago already, that in the 1970s in Latin America, these dissonant dissenting forms were not there. They were there but they lacked the political platform and the public presence they have now. What Nancy Frazier rightly calls what they have now is coalitions of the counter publics to great truth. The innovation and reinvigoration here is clearly moving, and this is crucial, from archives to archiving as a practice, a creative activity, a political practice and the verb. The political grammar matters. Note the shift of the term from this common noun to the gerund form, right? A gerund, as we know, often described as a verbal noun in the middle ground between verb and noun. It's what you're doing, not what you're looking at at all. It's what you do. You're archiving in a world of literal archives. Some of the most significant archiving projects I witnessed in Palestine and by Palestinians were in the minor mode, experimental, short solicitation, barely, barely funded, not all the huge they bugs that go into it. So we have to do Zoom conferences rather than in person conversation. I think this is just such a diminution of education and what it is. It, it, it just arrests pedagogy that I'm up here talking head and I get maybe one or two questions and then you all go home and I go home, you know, and you have a reception and I go back to what I'm doing. That's wrong. In person matters and it matters a lot and there's no longer any investment in it. Archiving <laughs> is what people are doing. But there's something else being, being called. It's being called the living archive. People are claiming not that their archives are in the passing home, but not that they're old and they're changing the politics of how they're doing it, but that archives themselves were living. That has garnered exceptional fashion. Emphasis as with archiving, both with the processes of making, but also on the recruitment of those not necessarily involved in the project. 
interesting. Um, directly, contributions constantly being added to change what subject means, what it represents, and where it needs to go. I think that's pretty radical, right? How do you keep that deal going? Well, how does it work? Living archives are not about the past. They're about the present. Calling something a living archive is an invitation. An invitation to young scholars. Right? And it's there for them all over the world. Whether in the public domain, local community libraries, in universities where students are invited to contribute to them. The University of California, Irvine, has what it calls a living archive, and students can walk by and add to it. How do we do it? 9.30 is, we still have time, right? 50 minutes, I was told by Anita. By its own definition, I quote, a collection of material presented to a lab for the expression, exhibit, document, and preservation of a sentiment or a movement in a particular community. Focus on the documentation and expression of the sentiment is worth noting. I mean, how do you show a sentiment? Right? How do you do that? It's hard to imagine the criteria. The three parts of the project, first, they have historical narrative, as if that's not sent. Then current reflection, and then real-time feedback. And I don't know, I'm not yet convinced. Or we might look on, on, uh, in, 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 on the web at livingarchive.org, which describes itself as a learning diaspora place to document, archive, pass on knowledge from and for the BIPOC community, right? So this is everyone, right? That is those who are colonized, those who are LGBT, who are gay, those who are disabled. It's just been folded into a whole. This is huge what's going on with this. Elsewhere, the Living Archive is a book documentation of a project that aims, as stated on its cover, to publish and preserve film history within artistic and curatorial practice of the present. Do you see how often this word present is coming in? Right? Again, the political grammar of our side has shifted to the present participle. My own close up witnessing of some of the innovations since from the time during COVID I spent working with interviewing and thinking with those in Palestine who have made up the practitioners of what I'm calling archival serve. And I can send the piece that this is part of in critical inquiry. I'll just send it to you. But it's also in my book, Interior Punch. Let me just briefly tell you a little about them. Okay? They're diverse in media, in scale, deeply political, emphatically anti-colonial, bold in their methods archiving rather than working in the archives or on the archives, redefines the terms of engagement. Instead of expending energy on countering authoritative inscription of, for instance, the Israeli state or the British colonial state or the Dutch colonial state, and its occupation, archiving seems to be offered an imaginative reprint of political. The whole thing is not geared towards the state and telling how that is. That's a different dimension. We've all been doing this for over 30 years. Right? Uh, the challenge is directed at what constitutes the challenge, and this is the finish Custodial control. Who's that guardian? Who has access? What medium is being used? What goes in what order? How much digital coding matters? Entry requirements all are in place. They're up to grant. Perhaps unexpectedly, some of these projects turn into more collective ones, some are very individual. I'm drawn to the small scale one, few with an institutional affiliation. I think that's really interesting because other guys have such a weight of institutional affiliation, right? This is the government archive, right, that we've inherited. Most limited profile. And that lack well that and the open up. I'm a different scientist from personal talk. Family groups that have inspired a wider community. And so much is in the past, is in peace, is stored in where one grandfather just left some of his. A distinctive feature is actually shared across the globe. Expansion 
of multimedia. So I talked about all these different ones. The actual archives that could be made are combining them all. It's perhaps ironic that those of us who have been working with archives for some time presume that the archives were once finished products, immovable, once deposited, and arrived in one place and one way. The notion that we are now living archives, with the sense that so many people can still go on and contribute to them, it doesn't suggest that the ones in the vault are dead. We might look at Matthew Connolly's 10-year project arguing that Trump's sequestered document at Mar, La at Mar Lago was not an exception. Everyone's made such a fuss because Trump is so awful, right? He's a thief in every way um, and racist. But basic to democratic state practice, governments intentionally Severed from its public and citizenry, an ex exploration of state archives, strewn across private desks, shared selectively with the selective members of the press, and most importantly for Connolly, the question altogether what is democracy of the present day? Is it democracy? Is this really democracy? One might ask a question, but in fact, he reminds us that the trash, dreaded, ripped up, trumped it all of them, right? is just staggering as what is there. And he writes, in his he calls it the declassification engine. The State Department is constantly using government, listen to this, a lot of it, to assign foreign policy documents for the He has a, a logarithm. We could just stop right there. What kind of He holds that this could mean, this is Connolly right, what's left will be dread, shock, absolute love. It's a long heaven. In a very literal sense, the end of history as we know. Still, the political project since 1985 of the National Security Archives is to make open 85,000 government documents. It's funded by 35 organizations with researchers literally anywhere, online, all over the U.S. Adding what's called the Torture Archive, you got to look online for that too, a culling of those documents relating to U.S. policy and this is not by the government. Okay, this is by those against it. The policy and practices of detention, interrogation, waterboarding, torture during the so called war on children. Digital open access. It's also problematic. But an important work is being done outside those quarters. Think Kirsten Wells' wonderful Chile excavation in an abandoned building filled with a crumbling stack of murderous state archives, buried, literally buried in the torture chamber of the dictator of Guatemala. Still, again, this is used in different forms, some in less dark forms, some in a liberal mode, endorsing, demanding <laughs> As in black studies, Native American studies, colonial studies, girls can see during newly arranged composites of people and things. Who doesn't love the Sadia Hartman? Fabulating configuration of young black women as champions of liberty. He had thought of them as the oppressed and as victims. No, Sadia Hartman saying no, they love to dance in the streets when no one would watch. Jenny Sharp. Traces of Caribbean literary and visual artists. I love it, that's where I got my title. Then the category of archival knowledge. Then the category themselves. And Ariela Azule, a anti colonial Israeli who doesn't like to think of herself as Israel, and now is at Brown University, insists that we make new contracts. We need new contracts. 
right, between archival practice and its citizenry. Vernacular idioms are sought from those reluctant to share their own duress or believe of insufficient pertinence. Lots of people in villages, all of the rest. No, I don't really have a story to tell. No, 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 I, I don't have anything. I'm not important, right? And I don't speak well with them. Frames are soft to enable, to enable unrecognized connections to regather what has gone astray. These labors promise to make room for the unforeseen. Mr. Serto would say bits and pieces. I call it a degree. Or the ignat that, that, that which touches you, right? Of a period. The macabre dark joke that plays off those in power in the menage. That those in power probably can't understand. Jean Pierre's <laughs> iconic formulation of politics makes visible that which has no reason to be seen. Great. Right? It makes visible what has no reason to be seen. That's Craxis. Some of the modest collections began as efforts that I saw in Palestine. This, this young man, Monaster Tarazi, born in a Christian family in Gaza, basically sidelines his day job in 2013 to begin documenting his family's history that grew to include a large spread of Christian Palestinians. Helen Kazan worked through a collection of archival photographs taken by her father on the eve of the family's flight from the Lebanese Civil War. Right? She made a short film that reconstructs and reactivates, as she put it, the spatialized nature of warfare to a film with these vague images of her own disappeared home, to which her parents cannot return ever. She's not after proof. I mean, we are always after proof, weren't we, when we looked at what the state did. And then we felt we did enough. But she wants to make legible the limited frame of accountability. This is one of my favorites. I'm still in touch with her a lot. And it gives me 10 minutes. Consider Fadi Asli. While studying Palestinian historian at the Hebrew University, he just got his PhD, he was fascinated with what was and was not neat counts documented about Palestine. So in 2016, he began a venture about what he had long fantasized, a construction of a material digital archive built by Palestinian villagers and in cities. Starting with his own family's ephemera, he spread out to families around, and then across the Arab world. He calls the project, has that, described as a voluntary <laughs> and Committed to people's stories, brochures, theater stuff, and receipts. I'm going to skip over because we don't have enough time. To date, he has 30,000 visits. I peruse this website. Everybody has their own archive that only some people can, they, they can give permission to see some of the materials and not the others. He says his aim is to instill a new archive awareness for what he's really after, he says, for a younger generation to understand what political policies, possibilities, and alliances that are always. So here's the conclusion. Very short. Five minutes. I think of archiving today as an embrace of what I call politicality. Not the firmness that everything's already political, but rather with the potential, the preserved possibility to be activated. Politicality comes with engagement, maybe a weighty form of address. Archiving practices may serve as prescripts, prescripts for the future, and proscriptions for now. In a cryptic comment, Derrida wrote that the archives work against themselves. We could just stop there, too. Note that his archive is in the singular. He wrote, the archive works again itself, excuse me. It's not a collection. Still, the question it raises for us as well, does an archive work against itself? Right? Government archives work actually totally against themselves. 
by disassembling asset collects, by leaving things out, right? By conserving, and one of the most important things that our cuts do is perform destruction. Destruction is actually one of the things that allows them the categories that they have. But it also raises a more uncomfortable quirk. Why are we so ready to this nomenclature archive? Why? Couldn't we come up with a better name of imaginaries that reach beyond the command of the state? I don't know what the vernacular would be where you are. Though I wonder if Fabiasi was doing something different with his stack cabinets. Archives, as Delphi does say, aren't mute. That was, I don't think he was in them ever. I don't think it was in the ones that you've been in. They're dormant fragments that escape pilfering soldiers awaiting a new relationship to establish with them. One might think of awaiting a prison that may be justice to them. I see the life of the document as a reserve weapon. Activation sustains its capacity to endure the weathering of being stored. Emphasis is on what it takes to carry through on the ordinary to adhere and recast relations of value while holding on to indignation. Okay. First writing these lines a few weeks ago, the announcement, there was a talk in the City University, came across my screen, imagining the black archive. A rejection is no dirt of 19th century archives of African American, American immigrants to the Dominican Republic. If you know where to look and how to do so. Countering takes work. Maybe what's emerged is a wholly different, and this is the last hour, archival ecology, excess, ephemera, new minimums of dissensus, forged in productive impatience. Maybe it's the impulse to carry through on the ordinary, to recast relations of value, to give new value to that which didn't have it, and care under capitalism's carceral and commodity obligation. Revised archiving practices may act as a forensic inquiry and restorative justice with abuse, surveillance, and denial put up for scrutiny. Masters of war don't get the last one. The archiving imperative is clearly outside the control by those marking up futures that refuse to be fulfilled. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. And can you get my voice now? Yes. Thank you. And, and apologies for the audio problem in the beginning. But we could we could hear you out completely. We could you were loud and clear throughout your speech. Oh, okay, because it, it seemed like you were losing me. There were three people there. You were looking also. I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry for that. No, that's okay. That's okay. I mean, you know, Zoom is not always reliable at all. Thank you. Thank you so much for the insightful keynote address. And uh, I know that you have another engagement. Uh, so, uh, I mean, if we send uh, some questions through the email, does it work for you? Absolutely. And if someone wants right now to ask a question, please, I, I still have time. Okay. So, uh, I definitely have time at least to 10 10, okay? To 10 after 10. And that's. Okay. So, I mean, uh, then I take the opportunity to ask this question, which is, mm -hmm. which is related to your book. Uh, against the archival grain, where you talked about uh, this distinction between archive as a process as opposed to archive as a thing. Uh, mm. Yes, so I think uh, for me and the kind of uh, archival research that we are pursuing here, uh, we <coughs> would be very much uh, eager to know how do you uh, look at it from today's perspective. I mean, in this context, do you go by that distinction even today? I mean, would you like to explain that further? I and mean, how do you see this distinction in today's context? Archive? Well, I think, yeah, it's a great question. And I think both matter in different ways, but the archive is not stable. It is no longer the same. 
right, in the present, but archiving as process brings in the agency of those of the present. I'm very interested, I think one of the really important things for me was to track, right, things in the archive that were classified as miscellaneous. I love things that are miscellaneous. Why don't they fit the colonial categories? Why sometimes do abandoned children not have a place? Sometimes they do, but there's no category actually abandoned children, right? There's a category of school, right? but not of abandoned children. I'm very interested also in process in the sense that you can't do what some graduate students have been taught to do. Pull out a jewel. I've got an archive, I've got a document nobody's seen. I now have my PhD. This is dynamite. This is a secret of the state. Well, you know, most secrets of the state are not secrets. Lots of people know about them. It's how they're secreted, and from whom. And what they do, my dear friend Val Daniel, I don't know if you know his name. Um, he's from Sri Lanka and worked a lot on archives at the University of Michigan. And at, um, he says they're secrets, but they secrete. They secrete into space. Right? They're not. You know, all the terms in Dutch, Half of the stuff was on white paupers. It was no secret. There were whites all over, as in India, that were paupers who lived on the sides of the railways. Right? There were so many, but that's not what they wanted. They didn't want those poor Scottish farmers in India. They didn't want that. They thought of it. They thought of a settler colonialism, but it couldn't work. It never worked. It never was a possible. So process is to reach outside the archive as well. The question, what goes for common sense? For me, that's not a document. That is a whole process of construction of what goes for common sense and need not be said in the archive, but it's not allowed to be said. That's part of process to me. Thank you. I have a question that relates to this one, which is uh, one of the earlier speakers today talked about the politics of the archive, which you have talked in detail in your book. Uh, he also mentioned about the hierarchies of archive. I mean, oh, yes. Yeah. So, situated in the global mm -hmm. south, when we talk about the archive, we understand that there are archives which are being digitized, which are prioritized, privileged in that sense, whereas Vast exactly. Of, yes, vast amount of archives in the global south, in Africa, in Asia, maybe in Latin American context are not uh, accessible either, or they're not digitized. Right. Yes. So your take on that, and how do you like? You oh, my take in that is when I say archives are part of the technology of rule, and the distribution of archives is about the construction of inequality in ecology in the politics of knowledge about colonialism, empire, but about the present and what endured. When I say in my book, duress, right? Imperial durabilities in our time. You can map that out. You can map it out very easily. I mean, a lot of stuff that was taken by the Dutch, it's incredible how much they took by the Brits, by, you know, Native Americans have never even gotten close to most of the archives on that, on genocide. Not even, of course, it was never called genocide. It was called manifest destiny for whites to go forward, right? The categories, the concepts, one of the most important things to me in my work, and always has been, is what I call concept work. Concept work is, I must emphasize, for students is not theory. It's not theory with a capital T. Oh, I gotta get the theory right. I gotta get this of, you know, a Gutari and a Ranaja, and I gotta get this of this person, of Jabir. That's not. 
That's not concept work. Concept work is when you pull apart those pieces that hide so much of the power relations within them, that assume that those are the categories in which you could work. You have to stretch them out, see what's inside. What is it Nietzsche said? There is no category of concepts that does not depend on putting together unequal things. On Is that brilliant? There's no concept that does not depend on putting together unequal things. Can you get at those? How do we read both along the grain of what they're doing, not just against the grain for the subaltern voice, the subaltern can't speak, I'm sorry, guy tree, you know? It's, there are other ways to speak. Don't quote me on that. He's a friend. But, you know, that was another moment. That was another moment when she needed, and she was right to have to write that then, that's 30 years ago. Right? We're in a different moment now. Thank you so much. Now, uh, Brian Masumi uh, talked about the idea of the anarchy. I'm sure that you... Wait, you, who? who? Uh, Brian Masumi. I'm talking about the process philosophy. Brian, oh, Brian, Brian Masumi? Masumi? Yes. He talked, he talked about the idea of the anarchive, and you mentioned about the archive of the epistemic space uh, acting as the decolonial episteme. I mean, we can use the archive as the decolonial tool. I mean, I remember uh, walking the Du Bois archive at Humus. I could see that the boxes which uh, contain the papers of Du Bois are like virtually incendiary boxes. They, they, they contain wonderful insights on decolonization to counter the predominant mm. uh, you know, narratives that we have. So mm -hmm. how do you look at the archive as the anarchive? I, I very much like to hear from you. Well, what do you think? What do you think is possible? I've spoken for an hour and 20 minutes. What, why is that question of interest in more than we've discussed? I don't, I don't use the term decolonial. I don't believe in it. Half the people who use, especially in the U.S. and in France and in Germany and in Australia, are many people who have never even studied or know what colonialism is. But everything is decoloniality now. Everything. Let's decolon decolonize a grocery store. So decoloniality is, is for me, it's a subterfuge in a way for almost not even knowing. But it's an umbrella. It's a proxy for so much else. But when I talk about these other kinds of archiving ventures, I mean, that is, and that doesn't even, that subordinates even the notion of an archive. For me, that is the answer. It is not, it's not saying as, and I pointed that out, as so many people do, this is an archive of the decolonial. Well, you're stuck, right? You've already kind of gotten yourself caught because you're trying to get authority in a way from where the command was. And now you're doing something else that classifies and categorizes in another way. So I think that's a place for us to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for wonderful questions. Actually, we could have a long conversation. Is there anybody else who would like to ask them? <laughs> um, my last question, I mean, uh, would like to know from you about your recent um, you know, intervention on the question of methodology of the use of archive. You have mentioned yeah. about yeah, the use of the method. So, okay. Yes. That's very, very clear. So I never call never talk about methodology alone. I think it's a problem. I don't teach on methodology alone. I think we have something that I have called conceptual methodology. You have to know, as Foucault once said, what the problem is. You have to know what the problem is in order to know what to ask and who the we 
in the question comes from. And I, I you know, that's for me just just crucial to what you're asking. Methodology has to come from what you are imagining and how wrong you can be. And methodology has to make room, as genealogy does, to the failures, to the, as one of my best students said, and has a book called it, Arrested Histories. Beautiful title, Arrested Histories. Um, suspended Histories. The method cannot be what's there alone. It has to come conceptually about how you know about what gets concealed. That's the methodology alone just can't get there. You have to have a conceptual vocabulary, a conceptual grammar that allows you to move outside of what is there, why it's not there. But you can't just say it's not there because it was erased. That doesn't give you an answer. It's because it may not fit common sense. It's because it's too dangerous and it goes against common sense because nobody cares about it at all, in quotes. So for me, conceptual methodology is part of the concept work, which is not theory. It's working on what Dickenstein called the rough ground. Not the high ground, but the rough ground. That's it. I mean, it's detailed. It's absolutely detailed. Gaston Bachelard has a, he says his goal was to write an epistemology of detail. Wow, what is that, right? But when I talk about epistemology, and this is my last comment, um, I think we caught epistemology as something about reason, right? Your theory of what's reasonable. I think what we've missed is how much there's an epistemology of affect, right? That affect is a way of knowing. That it is Sophia, as the Greeks called it. It is not not knowing. It is always, we all look at all philosophy, classical philosophy, all of it, right? Though Aristotle said something really interesting about anger. He said it's undeserved diminishment, right? It's undeserved. And that's political, right? That's a judgment. I mean, for Aristotle, affect was judgment. Sentiment was judgment. It wasn't only judgment and reason, as the colonial state did. They got caught by it because they didn't understand this, this politics of sentiment. So that's what I mean by epistemology, is breaking through that. Dr. Stoner, thank you so much for being here in Atlas. We hope that this conversation will continue and we have questions and we'll certainly email that to you. And on behalf of everyone present here, I express our collective thanks and gratitude to you for taking time out for such an engaging and insightful Thank you. Thank you so much. But please, one more thing. Please don't think I'm not going to answer because I can't do it this week. I am leaving for uh, Vienna. I'm traveling. So it's not, if I don't answer, don't think, oh, she, you know, she just said that and she isn't going to answer. I, I will. Thank I will. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Bye-bye.